Cliff and I have been playing the same game of tag for over 15 years now. It's just a dumb kid's game, yet I'm terrified for my life. It began the summer before secondary school. Cliff had just moved to Sheffield, a few streets from my house. I saw him at the park a few times by himself. One day, he simply walked over and asked if I wanted to play a game of tag. I agreed, and we've stayed friends ever since. All through our teenage years, the gap year and university, we've kept this game of tag bubbling between us. Why? I could never muster a satisfying answer. I guess we were both competitive people. We liked to win, and nobody lost as long as the game kept going. After university, I had to move to London to chase my dreams of being a cinematographer. Cliff was staying put. He had a life here now. He'd been seeing Olivia for a couple of years by that point, and things were getting serious. During our farewell, he hugged me close before tapping me on the shoulder. Tag, you're it, he whispered. We promised to see each other every few weeks, but life got in the way like it always does. My career semi took off, and Cliff started a family with Olivia, giving birth to their first child, Rosie. The game became an excuse to visit each other for our birthdays. We'd surprise the birthday boy by turning up unannounced and tagging them. This went on for many years, the element of surprise fading into the background. It was simply an excuse to keep our friendship alive. A few years back, I'd had some time off between projects without much to do. I hadn't heard from Cliff for a while, so I decided to genuinely surprise him for his birthday. The plan? Turning up on his doorstep a week early, tagging him and then demanding we go out and get drunk. I packed up my camper van and drove to Sheffield. It felt like the perfect plan, but it turned out to be the worst decision of my life. It was 8 p.m. by the time I parked up outside of Cliff's house. The place was dark, but Cliff's car was parked in the driveway. I watched the house for a few minutes to see if anyone was home. A figure moved by one of the bay windows of the living room, still shrouded in darkness. Somebody was home. I crept up the drive and went to knock on the door. Just as my knuckles were about to strike, Cliff appeared in the doorway, dressed as if he was about to head out. What the fuck? He said, his expression frozen in stern shock. I threw my hands up and smiled. Surprise! He didn't say anything for a while. He just stared at me, his mouth forming into a slight grimace. I slowly leaned forward, extended my finger and jabbed him in the chest. Tag, you're it! I said. Does Olivia know you're coming? No, but... You can't just drop in like this, he said. That's why I bought my camper. I'll sleep in there tonight. I just want a couple of beers. Let me talk to Olivia. I'm sure I can convince her, I said. Cliff shook his head and yanked the front door closed with some force. She's taken Rosie to see her mum for the week. Her grandpa is on his last legs. Sorry to hear that, I said, waiting the appropriate amount of time before speaking again. But am I right in thinking that means you're free tonight? I gave him my best shit-eating grin. Cliff looked back at the door, then at me. He kicked some mud off his shoe like a bashful kid. Fine, a couple of pints, no more. I've got a busy day tomorrow, he said. After six beers, Cliff was in a much better mood. He seemed more relaxed than I'd seen him in years. I knew his job was tough, something complicated with finance, great pay but terrible work-life balance, and raising a kid can't be easy. But now he was cracking jokes, buying tequila shots, and even sneaking a few cheeky cigarettes from me. It felt like we were teenagers again, just two best friends enjoying each other's company. Cliff came stumbling back to the table, 
two pints sloshing in his hands. He slumped into the stool next to me and slapped me on the back. You really got me, man, he slurred. I wrapped my arm around his shoulder. I was always the better player, I said. That always used to wind him up. He smiled at me like a banshee, all teeth and gums. I'm going to get you when you least expect it, he said, his tone almost musical. It took us twice the time to get home, with multiple sick and piss stops along the way. Our conversation dwindled as we eventually arrived at his house. I unlocked the camper van and went to step in. You can come in if you want, he said, the first words he'd spoken in the last ten minutes. His tone was desperate, like the lonely kid I met on the playing field all those years ago. My vision was spinning like a merry-go-round. I don't think I'll make it, I need to sleep. Sure? he asked. I nodded, causing a sharp pain behind my right eye. The hangover headaches were already creeping across my skull. He was working the next day, so I promised not to disturb him. I had a long drive back anyway and needed a few pit stops to pick up snacks and to question my life choices before getting home. We hugged goodbye and he squeezed me tight. I thought I was going to be sick. A week later, I thought I would be sick again, but for a very different reason. Back at home, I was prepping for a shoot when the police called. Did I know I'd spent the night with a murderer? Cliff had stabbed Olivia and Rosie the morning before I visited. One minute he was having breakfast with his family. The next, he was puncturing holes into both of them with a fillet knife. Their blood was still oozing over the kitchen tiles by the time I arrived just a few hours later. He'd left them to rot there while we got drunk together. The police almost seemed delighted to talk to me, certain that I could shed some light on the case. That certainty was quickly replaced with mild shock and deep frustration as I told them that we'd spent the whole night together and that I'd noticed absolutely fuck all. Cliff seemed fine, better than fine. He seemed great. There was no motive, no suspects and no leads. One thing was for certain, they'd been a happy family. No evidence of secret affairs or hidden debts. It was like Cliff simply decided to detonate the life he'd spent so long building. I loved Olivia and Rosie and now they'd been wiped from the planet by someone I'd called my best friend. I spent the next few weeks in a daze, replaying the night endlessly in my head, searching for clues to what had happened to my friend of 15 years. You'd think all that time with someone would mean that you'd get a grasp on the kind of person they are. What a joke. We all wear masks, but some are hiding uglier faces than others. So much of the night was a blur, it was hard to piece it all together. But there was one moment that I couldn't shake. I'm gonna get you when you least expect it. Was Cliff still playing tag with me? The police said he'd gone into hiding somewhere in the Peak District. They were searching high and low, but they hadn't found a clue yet. He'd packed nothing and left on foot. The lead officer believed he'd gone out into the woods to die, that we'd find his body washed up in a ditch somewhere. But I knew better. If there was still a hint of the old cliff out there, he'd be plotting to get me back. He never liked to lose, and while he was it, he was losing. Months went, and still nobody knew where Cliff had gone. I knew he hadn't gone far. He was out there, creeping along the peripheries of my vision, waiting for the best opportunity to strike. I shed friends and jobs like a dying snake. I couldn't leave the house knowing there was a chance he was still out there. He'd appear in busy crowds, smiling just like he did when I saw him after he'd murdered his family. Sometimes the crowds would part and I'd realize it wasn't Cliff. 
other times, his features, now gaunt and wild, remained unchanged. One night, I was in my office reviewing some footage for a new film I was working on. I looked out my window, and there he was, crouched by my shed, obscured by shadows. I told myself it was just a trick of my mind. But then, I saw his face, pale white and illuminated by the full moon. He was smiling. I grabbed my phone off the desk and called the police, but by the time they picked up, he was gone. Months turned to years, and Cliff still hadn't been found. The police had uncovered some human remains in a cave a few miles outside of Sheffield, but they hadn't been able to identify who it was or how long they'd been there. Interest in the story dwindled, and everyone moved on to the next violent atrocity. Even I had stopped seeing him so much, except for the occasional nightmare. My bank account had dried up, and I needed to find work. I spent the last of my savings on a therapist to untangle me from the web of shame and paranoia that kept me trapped inside my house. Questions still plagued me. How was I meant to trust someone again? Do we ever really know the people we love? What made Cliff do what he did? I came to accept that I would never find out the answers. After many long and painful sessions, I finally started to feel like a shell of a normal human. I was able to leave the house, look people in the eye, and begin to rebuild my life. But the guilt never left. Even after all the pain I'd been through, at least I was still alive. That's more than can be said about Olivia and Rosie. I'd celebrated with the man who wiped them from this world and spent the night sleeping next to their corpses. I needed to move on from this nightmare, and the only way to do that was to say a final goodbye. I packed up my camper van and headed to Sheffield, to the cemetery where they were both buried. It was a cold, bitter winter morning. The wind tugged at my hair and clothes as I marched along the endless rows of crumbling graves, desperately searching for Olivia and Rosie. I eventually found them tucked away in a quiet corner underneath a great oak tree. The wind screamed through its branches, creating a ceaseless white noise. I tried concentrating on the names carved on the graves, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My heart was racing. Why had I come here? A branch snapped behind me. I spun around. It was a squirrel watching me from a few rows along. It cocked its head at me before running as fast as it could in the other direction. There wasn't another soul in the entire cemetery. I was utterly alone. I took a deep breath and looked back at the names Olivia and Rosie. I said I was sorry and replaced the crusted remains of some old flowers with the fresh daffodils I'd bought. Clearly nobody had visited them in a long time. Something deep in my gut told me that Cliff was gone. He'd lost his mind and starved to death in the middle of some woods. The end of an unexplainable tragedy. I said goodbye to all three of them that day and drove home but sometimes your gut instinct can be wrong. So very, very wrong. Last week, I was at a house party against my will. My newish girlfriend had dragged me there and told me it would be fun. It was anything but. I'd necked a bottle of wine in less than an hour and the queue to the toilet was four people deep. My bladder isn't what it used to be so I snuck out into the garden to find a secluded spot. As I stepped outside, the floodlight illuminated the garden in a stark white. I crept to a shadowy corner. After a few seconds, the garden turned black as the floodlight switched off. For a while, all I could hear was the sound of my own piss. Then I heard the pattering of feet behind me. They were rushing at full pace, the floodlights switched back on. I spun around. A naked figure was running across the garden towards me. It was Cliff, 
and he was coming fast, his body lean and muscular like an animal. His skin was smeared in dirt and muck, some old, some new, with a long scrappy beard and greasy hair. He grinned at me with missing teeth. His thick right arm was outstretched. His dark eyes glinted in the moonlight. Five giant fingers stabbed my chest, sending a jolt of sharp pain across my ribs. The force pushed me back against the garden fence. I tried to let out a scream, but it got caught in my throat. Cliff put his face up close to mine, his rotten breath stinging my nostrils. Tag, you're it, he said. He leant across me and took a deep breath by my neck, as if savouring my scent for the final time. Then he leapt back and ran back across the garden at a horrific speed, disappearing over the garden fence. I whimpered as I slid down the fence, trying to hold back the tears. Nobody believes me. Not even the police. I can't lose more years of my life hiding away in my house. I need to take control. Cliff is out there, alive. Not only that, he's winning at tag. And I can't let that murdering piece of shit win. I've got to hunt him down for Olivia and Rosie. Fuck it, for me too. I'm going to find him. And I'm going to end this game once and for all. My name's Booker. I work at a vet hospital outside of Juniper in West Virginia. I live with my two cats and an off-again, on-again significant other. I'm coherent and of sound mind. I've tried telling this story a thousand times. I've tried telling my parents, my friends, my co-workers, but there's no way to tell it without sounding like a complete lunatic. Their eyes just glaze over and I get the smile. You know the one. So I figured I'd write it all down instead. Try to make it cohesive. Maybe someone has seen something similar. On February 17th, 2023, I was heading to work. I took the I-79 toward Morgantown when I came across a parked vehicle on the side of the road. Looked like some sort of older gen Toyota Avalon. It must have been there for some time since there was snow covering parts of the hood. I could see a big dent on one side and a crack in the passenger side window. One of the doors was open. I pulled over and glanced at it from afar. I couldn't see anyone in there. I looked up the number to the sheriff's office and called it in. Gave them my name and all. They told me they'd look into it. I had to work a bit later than usual that day. An hour or so, nothing major. When I was finally heading back home, it was already dark out. It was somewhere around 6.30 p.m. when I got to that same stretch of road where I'd seen that Avalon earlier that morning. And 10 hours later, it was still there. The snow was stacked higher by now, but it was impossible to miss it. I figured the sheriff ignored my call. Somewhere along the line, someone dropped the ball. This thing needed to be towed, or there could be a nasty accident. As all this went through my mind, I took my eyes off the road. And in that split second, someone stepped in front of my car. I swerved, but it was too late. There's a very distinct sound to hitting someone with your vehicle. There's something like a whiplash effect when the head swings around and smacks into the windshield. It's like when you're swinging a bat, putting all the power at the very end. There was an explosion of blood, like a popped balloon. The sudden cracks in the windshield let in a whiff of cold highway air. I was doing everything I could to stop. I remember this strange sound, like a wounded animal. 
I know it was just me, screaming. But it was such an unusual sound that I can't help thinking it came from someone else. When I finally came to a full stop, I was already on my phone with the emergency services. I was trying to remain calm, but my hands wouldn't stop shaking. I kept hearing bleeping noises as my fingers accidentally kept hitting numbers. I was telling the operator my name, address, what had happened, everything. Hell, I probably told them what I had for lunch. I got out of the car and saw the victim on the side of the road. I'd watched enough shows to know I shouldn't move them. But I wanted to be near and do what the operator asked. The victim was a young man, no older than 16, maybe 17 years old. We had the same hair, only his hadn't been brushed in a while. He was wearing this forest green hoodie with a pair of black jeans. There were branches and brambles stuck all over him, and I could see these little cuts and jabs along his clothes. He also had a peculiar smell. Chemical, like ammonia, I think. His eyes were wide open, staring straight ahead. He didn't make any sound. No grunting, no wincing. He was just taking small breaths, laying there. There was a tiny pool of blood by his temple. The operator kept yelling in my ear, trying to get my attention. They wanted me to make sure he was breathing. Hold your hand about an inch in front of his face, she said. Can you feel the wind? I held my hand down and felt a cold breath push against my skin. But there was also a little huff, like he smelled me. Suddenly, his eyes darted my way. He seemed to investigate my clothes. Once I acknowledged he was breathing, they asked me to acknowledge he was conscious. I told them he was looking at me, but they needed an estimation of his mental state. Sir, I said, can you see me? Do you know where you are? His eyes locked straight ahead again. He didn't move an inch. I repeated myself over and over, trying to get his attention. Finally, I put a hand on his shoulder. That caught his attention. Bad man, he whispered. He had this strange wheeze to his voice. I figured something was broken or that he was trying to keep a straight face. I couldn't quite put my finger on why, but it bothered me. I was told to stay with him until the ambulance arrived. I turned on the hazard lights and made sure my car was well off to the side. I tried to be comforting. I tried telling him it was going to be okay and I carefully held his hand. He didn't react. He just stared straight ahead and whenever I seemed a bit insistent, he'd give me that strange look and say the same thing. Bad man, help. When the ambulance arrived, I stepped back. They asked me a bunch of questions and tried to assess the damage. I told them about the head trauma and showed them the blood on my windshield. But that seemed to confuse them. For someone to take that kind of head trauma and still be conscious seemed strange. They figured he'd had a major concussion and gone into shock. They pulled out a stretcher, carefully moved him and put the safety straps on. The police were on their way and my car was going to get towed. I was freaking out. I didn't know how to get home or if my insurance would cover this or how I'd get to work on Monday or just a thousand little worries all at once. From the stories I've heard, this man might sue me for everything I owned. You hear all the time about Samaritans stopping to help only to get screwed over. One of the paramedics stopped to look me over but could see that I was in no immediate risk. Still, I could be concussed. They told me it'd be best if I rode along with them to get a thorough check at the hospital. I could ride up front while they kept the strange man in the back for observation. Slight breach of policy, but nothing major. I got in and we took off down the road. 
I could see the police in the rearview mirror, just seconds behind us. They stopped at the accident site. The ambulance driver was a woman in her late thirties. She had a calm demeanour and this sinewy kind of strength. Like she could lift a truck, but also be knocked over by a sudden gust of wind. She tried her best to keep me in check. I'm sure you're okay, she said. But it's better to be sure. You got that insurance for a reason. Maybe you ought to just drop me off, I said. You guys have got your hands full. We've got people waiting on sight, she smiled. Don't worry, you'll be in and out in ten minutes. Just have a nurse check up on you first, all right? All right. I could hear the paramedic in the back try his best to establish contact with the victim. He asked him questions, tried to keep him calm, and encouraged him to stay awake. The victim didn't move. Not an inch. I think there's an obstruction, I heard. I'm checking his throat. My mind was racing. I could still be held accountable for some kind of accidental manslaughter charge, or something similar. I hadn't been drinking, but maybe there could be a false positive on a drug test. I didn't know for sure every ingredient in that lunch sandwich I ate. I tried to stay calm and listen to the driver. She smiled at me, nodded, and told me it was going to be okay. Then there was that moment. It was like the sound of the engine faded away. I remember the words clear as day. There's something in his throat. Looking up, I saw dark figures appearing on the road ahead of us. What happened next is hard to describe. It was like an explosion went off. There was an enormous force pushing against the left side of the vehicle, forcing the driver to swerve right to compensate. There was a scream as the paramedic in the back was flung into the wall. I heard the safety straps on the stretcher bend and the sudden twang of metal as something snapped. Flesh smacked into the glass, separating the front and back of the ambulance. There was a spatter of red and black, along with strands of brown hair. The screaming in the back stopped. There was panic. The swerving was out of control. I heard pounding coming from the back of the ambulance, but couldn't see through the blooded glass. Bad man, help. That strange, monotone voice. Every word emphasised another hit. We were going too fast, passing by streetlights. I saw it all play out like a strobe effect. The driver trying to regain control. The bloodied glass denting. Brown eyes looking up at me and the two of us understanding that we'd lost control. Then it all came to a stop. We hit something and all air was pushed out of my lungs as something in my chest snapped. I was flung against the seat belt as the world shifted around me and we came tumbling down a slope, screaming, broken glass, my world turning upside down, tossing me around like a handkerchief in a snowstorm. And then it was quiet. I was scared to open my eyes, thinking I might be dead. When I finally opened them, I heard the back of the ambulance open. There was an enormous pressure on my right arm, and it took me a few seconds to realise the ambulance had flipped to the side, with the driver's door positioned upwards. The airbag had deployed as the driver had her head at an angle possibly giving her some kind of neck damage. Her arms hung haplessly down towards me as she groaned, trying her best to move. I hadn't even noticed the airbags going off. But now that they lay deployed and used, I could see that they probably saved my life. I could barely see anything. There were no immediate lights here, and everything was at a strange angle. If I concentrated, I could make out a few stars in the sky. One of the headlights was still on, but that just illuminated the ground ahead. I felt snow brush against my hand 
as I realised most of the passenger side window on my side was gone. I stayed still, waiting, trying my best to catch my breath. My lungs ached and every bit of movement on my part caused a new string of pain to shoot through me. My head was ringing and I couldn't identify what exactly was wrong with me. Then the door on the driver's side was torn off. It was almost effortless. I heard some kind of mechanism struggle, but all it took was a rough pull and it came loose. Bad man, help! I heard someone wheeze. I tried to shield my eyes from falling glass as I looked up. Someone was lifting the driver out of her seat. No, no, she complained. Uh, wait, you, you can't. Then a hard pull. She screamed. She was still stuck on something, but whoever was pulling her out didn't care. Instead, they pulled harder. I heard something snap as she came loose and heard a thump as they unceremoniously threw her off the side of the ambulance. I heard an impact and then she went quiet. I saw the silhouette of someone looking down at me, someone with a green hoodie. Bad man, help, he said. Something was telling me to run, to kick, fight, scream, and force my way out the broken windshield. I felt this instinct, telling me that this was something far more dangerous than a car crash. That strange monotone voice was unmistakable. This was the man I'd hit with my car earlier. In a moment of instinct, I froze. I closed my eyes, leaned my head away and just lay as still as possible. I felt the ambulance shift as he climbed down and tugged on my jacket. Fingers ran down my face, like when a cat tries to poke you with its paw for attention. I stayed still, holding my breath. Another tug at my jacket, and then they climbed back out, leaving the driver's side wide open. They weren't interested in dead people. I tried to stay still. One of the headlights was still on, and I could see dark shapes moving outside. I could feel my pulse rising and slowing as my body demanded air, but every breath felt like a risk. I tried counting them to keep myself calm. There were four people outside. One of them was the man in the green hoodie, but the other three had wandered in from seemingly nowhere. An overweight and balding man with a thick red scarf, a tall muscular woman with some kind of choker, and lastly, someone who looked like a 12-year-old girl. None of them was appropriately dressed for the season, yet none of them seemed to freeze. Also, I couldn't see them breathe. I tried to get my phone out of my pocket, but it was difficult without moving too much. The deflated airbag kept crinkling when I moved, and I didn't want the people outside to notice. They had dragged the paramedics into the snow and seemed to be inspecting them. One of the four people, the one who looked like a young girl, perked her ears up and looked off in the distance. It kind of reminded me of how a meerkat alerts the flock. The others stopped to look at her. Then, in a coordinated movement, they all dropped to the ground, seemingly dead. One by one, they started screaming with these eerie, hollow voices. Help! Help! Bad man, help! I could hear voices in the distance an old woman screaming, oh my God, over and over. A man telling them help is on the way. Another man shouting, telling them to hold on. From behind the cracked windshield, I saw a man drop to his knees in the snow, putting his ear to the mouth of the one with the hoodie. I wanted to signal him to run or to back away, but I couldn't risk myself being pulled into this. If I exposed myself, it might be a death sentence. Whatever these people were doing, there was something fundamentally wrong. He's not breathing, the man yelled out, 
Hurry! He pushed the hoodie back, straightened the man's neck, and started to administer CPR. Heart compressions, and then mouth to mouth. He did it several times, and I saw people coming down from the highway slope to check them out. One was on his way over to help the tall woman. Then there was a strange sound. The man administering mouth to mouth stopped. He made this strange gurgling noise as he tried to pull himself up. At a glance, it seemed that the man with the hoodie had somehow attached his face to him, like a suction cup. There was a struggle and a pained humming noise, growing louder, like someone screaming into a pillow. For a moment, the men's lips separated and I saw something ivory white moving in the space between. The man with the green hoodie did something impossible. It looked like his shoulder blades moved independently of his arms, pushing him up with an impossible sit-up, still with the man administering CPR on top of him. He flipped over, putting himself on top with the man underneath him. Then, walking on all fours like a scurrying insect, he started to drag him, mouth to mouth, away from the highway slope. At this point, a switch clicked in my head. These weren't people. I couldn't stay calm any longer, and there was no way that I'd try to fake being dead any longer. I couldn't risk it. Instead, I forced my leg up and started climbing out of the ambulance, putting my dirty shoes down on the expensive equipment, using it as a springboard. There were so many screams. I saw the tall woman bite down on the calf of her would-be rescuer and drag him off. The twelve-year-old girl jumped on the back of another, biting into their neck and digging her fingers into their chest. It was so fast, like they'd practiced it. It was perfectly coordinated, and in a matter of seconds they'd overpowered three people. The moment I got out of the ambulance, I noticed one of them looking at me, the balding man. He had these wide black eyes and a strange looking tongue. It was completely white and had a split end, like a cluster of noodles or snake heads. For a split second, we just looked at one another. Then he dropped to all fours and started galloping towards me. I jumped off the ambulance, only to lose the remaining air in my lungs. I had clearly broken something and couldn't stand up straight. I just couldn't. The nerves didn't obey the way they should. My leg was sprained, but as long as I didn't bend it, I could move pretty fast. The ambulance had driven straight off the highway, down a slope, and slid into a field. I could see this long stretch of barren ground where snow had been pushed away. There was a small patch of trees next to us, and I decided to rush through it. Maybe it would slow him down enough for me to catch my breath. I was getting lightheaded, like I couldn't push enough air into my body. Bad! Man! Help! Bad! Man! Hell! The balding man kept repeating the same words over and over with every gallop. It had such an unnatural sound to it, a voice coming from down low, with such an unearthly monotone cadence. I rushed through the patch of trees with the balding man catching up to me. He didn't seem the least bit bothered. He crawled over logs and bushes with ease, much faster than what I did. The only thing I had going for me was a head start and this burning panic pushing me forward. I got to the side of the slope and started climbing. It was at least 16 feet and a steep angle, so I had no choice but to crawl my way up. It was part dirt and part gravel, making me slide whenever I put too much weight on it. Fortunately, the balding man was much heavier than me. He had a lot of trouble getting up but he made up for it in enthusiasm and sheer abandon. He dug his hands in, he kicked with his feet, he jumped and lunged. And little by little, 
he was catching up to me. His hand touched the sole of my shoe. Instinctively, I kicked. I felt my heel connect with something soft as cartilage gave way to rubber. I looked down. I could barely make out anything with the waning light from the streets above. But I saw this blank face with these completely black eyes looking up at me. His nose was broken, almost ripped from his face, but there was no blood. All I saw was these little white strings under his skin, waving back and forth. Slowly, the string started to pull the nose back to its original place. In a hissing warning, he opened his mouth and I saw straight into his throat, where something moved. I made it back up to the highway and started sprinting. In my mind, he was just inches away and I didn't want to find out what would happen if he caught me. I didn't want to be dragged off into the dark. Instead, I heard cars approaching in every direction. Some honked, others switched lanes. I sprinted straight across, hearing the man switch from a gallop to a two-legged run. I was climbing across the midsection when I flinched from the pain in my chest. The air in my lungs escaped me, and in that moment of hesitation, he caught up to me. He grabbed a hold of my jacket and started pulling me back. Bad man, help. He was too strong, not just for me, but in general. There was this cramp-like pull in his fingers, like iron clasps. I tried to pull away, but I just couldn't. I tried to scream for help, but I had no air left in my lungs and I was getting dizzy. Instead, with the last bit of strength in me, I undid the zipper on my jacket. It came flying off and my assailant lost his footing. I saw him stumbling backwards, straight into an oncoming moving truck. The balding man bounced off the hood like something out of a pinball machine. He tumbled into the road as the moving truck stepped on the brakes, trying their best to honk to warn the other drivers. I found an opening and headed straight for the truck, yelling along the way. Stay! Stay in! Don't go out! Keep your windows up! I got to the passenger side. There was only the driver inside and I knocked. He let me in. A man in his late sixties, clearly shaken. He could barely contain himself. I tried to calm him, but we just ended up screaming at one another. Finally, I pointed to the balding man, still illuminated by the headlights. He's not dead, I repeated. He's faking. He's faking it. The driver didn't listen. He opened the door, but I grabbed his coat. I didn't let him go. After a few seconds of struggling back and forth, he tried punching me. We scuffled a bit until we noticed flashing lights in the rearview mirror. Two police officers approached us, but there were more coming down the opposite side. I pointed at the balding man, screaming the same thing over and over, telling them he wasn't dead, that he was faking, that I'd been attacked. One of the officers pulled me aside. Are you sure? He said. Are you sure about this? Of course I was. I tried telling them everything at once, making me jumble the words and lose my train of thought. The two officers exchanged a look and the other approached the balding man. In one swift movement, he pulled out his handgun and fired eight rounds. It was like the world stopped for a second. All screams and shouts faded away with my ringing ears. The balding man took eight rounds, but still squirmed. He took four more to the chest before he stopped moving. One of the officers started repeating numbers into his walkie-talkie, while the other stayed with me and the driver. We're taking you home, he said. No questions right now. Let's just get you home. I was put in the squad car, along with the driver of the moving truck. Just minutes later, 
the road was swarming with flashing lights. I saw some policemen move to the side of the road, looking down the slope. As we drove away, I heard several of them open fire against something down below. Handguns, shotguns, rifles, a firing squad illuminating the dark. When they realized I was wounded, I was taken to the hospital. The incident was reported as a traffic accident. No matter who I talked to about it, they all said the same thing. Traffic accident. That's what it said in all the papers, online, and in all the reports. That's all I got to hear. Over and over. Traffic accident. Not a single source mentioned handguns being discharged or people being carried into the woods. I was diagnosed with a concussion, a broken rib, and two small fractures just below the knee on my left leg. Every time I tried to mention what really happened, I was immediately dismissed. Not a single reputable news source would listen, claiming I was concussed and obsessed with popular fiction. Apparently, these things are a common urban myth. They call them scarf people, and there have been stray reports and hoaxes relating to them for years. Fake people using devious tactics to lure victims into secluded areas. It goes against my nature to look the other way when I see people get hurt. I want to help. I want to be there. But now I know that there are things out there that aren't playing by the same rules. They're just playing possum. For context, I am a middle-aged man who lives on the outskirts of Parbold, a small English village. My house is the only one on a long, winding country road, but it does have a bus stop. From my bedroom window, I can see it on the other side of the road. It's quite handy, really. I never miss the morning bus to work, and I know the schedule off by heart. That's why I was bewildered when I first noticed the 3.17am bus on Saturday, the 14th of October. It woke me up, actually. I'm a light sleeper. I sat upright in my bed, twisted my body around, propped myself up on my knees, and gingerly inched the curtains open. The old lamppost on my road illuminated an ominous, fully grey, non-branded, single-decker bus. There was no interior lighting, I couldn't see a driver or any passengers. Now this was obviously bizarre. Buses don't show up at that time in the morning. Not in this country. Not in any town or city I know, anyway. Still, I assumed, as any person would, that times were changing. It seemed like a good idea. A bus for those who've missed the last train home after a night out, perhaps. That still didn't entirely make sense, because very few people use my bus stop. It's a ten-minute walk from here to anywhere. I checked the schedule. Nothing. There was a bus at 11.07 on Friday evening, and there shouldn't have been another one until 6.05 on Saturday morning. I watched the vehicle pull away, and considered, perhaps, that it wasn't a public bus. Maybe it was a hired coach, that seemed like a reasonable explanation. I put it out of my mind and went back to sleep. However, it returned the next morning and it continued to do so for weeks. Again, I checked the schedule. Still no mention of a 3.17 a.m. bus. I called the council and they assured me that it wasn't a public bus. They said that I could contact the local authorities to report any suspicious activity. So I rang the police. They didn't care. They passed me over to some civil department with a forgettable name. And that department passed me over to another department. Nobody was concerned. It became clear that each person I contacted just wanted me to tire of the whole thing and stop bothering them. I gave up on seeking help but I didn't give up on my quest for an answer. 
I started making notes. The bus always arrived at exactly 3.17 a.m. It would linger for approximately 30 seconds. Nobody ever boarded or departed the vehicle. I took a picture of it and posted it on various forums. Nobody could identify the origin of the faceless grey bus, but one comment did stand out. I remember a user telling me that I should sell my house and move. They said that the bus was there for me. Most importantly, they said that I shouldn't, under any circumstances, board it. That seemed like a rather obvious piece of advice. I wasn't planning on boarding a sketchy, unlisted bus in the pitch black hours of the morning. But everything changed on November 20th. The bus arrived on time. 3.17 a.m. I knelt on my bed and peeked at it through the curtain as it rounded the corner. Something was different. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Once the vehicle had rolled to a complete stop, I heard it. Somebody on the bus was screaming. I froze. I didn't know what to do. Silence followed, but I knew I hadn't imagined it. I knew I'd heard that scream. I watched the bus and waited. 30 seconds passed. A lot of time passed. When I finally peeled my eyes from the road to check my phone, it was 3.29 a.m. The bus hadn't moved. The world outside was still eerily quiet. I reattached myself to reality and started dialing triple nine. The call kept failing, and then I saw that I had no signal. None. I usually had signal at the house. I was freaking out, so I got up to turn on my bedroom light. Nothing. I flicked the switch back and forth. No power. The story was the same throughout the house. I was about to head to the fuse box, but I looked out of my living room window to see a blackened world. The lamppost was dead. It had to be a power cut. That was when I finally understood, for the first time in my ten years of solitary living, that I was truly isolated. I had no neighbours, no friends, no family. I was all alone. The gravity of the situation dawned on me. I would have to leave the house. My self-preservation instinct was to stay indoors but I couldn't ignore the disembodied scream that had echoed through the night. I knew it had come from the bus. I knew I couldn't live with myself if I were to dismiss it. Armed with a winter coat and a wind-up torch, I bravely ventured into the night, locking my door behind me. I tentatively strolled down my front path, stopping at the gate to cast the torchlight onto the other side of the road. It revealed the grey, stationary, seemingly abandoned bus. There were no signs of life. Everything was so quiet. I swore to myself that I could hear my heartbeat in my eardrums. I swung the creaky gate open and began to cross the road, futilely attempting to steady my quaking knees. My torch wobbled in my shaky left hand, so I clasped my wrist with my right hand. I shone the light into the windows of the parked vehicle. There was definitely no driver, but it was an elevated coach, so I couldn't see whether there were any passengers. I walked around the front of the vehicle, summoning the courage to enter it. When I reached the other side of the bus, I stood still. I tried to control my breathing. I eyed the doors for what seemed an eternity, and then I felt my entire body clench. The doors opened. My torchlight still wasn't revealing a driver. I couldn't see or hear anyone. I thought, for a brief moment, of that internet stranger who told me not to board the bus. But I couldn't get the scream out of my head. My gut told me that somebody was in danger. I stepped onto the bus and started to climb the stairs. The doors closed. I held the torch before me as if it were a weapon 
and I gradually climbed the next set of stairs to the elevated passenger platform. I spent several seconds on each step, savouring what I felt could be my final moments on Earth. Then, I illuminated the passenger area before me. I half expected to see nothing. No, there was somebody on the bus. A young girl was sitting on the middle seat of the back row. Her head was in her palms. She was crying. I couldn't see her face. Are you okay? I asked timidly. No answer. So I started to walk forwards. I didn't know whether there was anyone else on board, but I couldn't leave her. Once I was standing only a few yards in front of her, I knelt down in the aisle. Are you okay? I asked a second time. The girl's crying abruptly ceased, but she didn't lift her head from her hands. You shouldn't have boarded the bus, she replied. My torch died. I furiously wound the lever at the side, but it didn't spring back to life. The girl and I had been plunged into darkness. Then I heard the bus doors open. I slowly turned my head to face the front of the bus. I could hear the sound of low guttural breathing. It was followed by clunking footsteps. Dim moonlight shone through the front window, but it was sufficient to display a hulking figure at the other end of the aisle. A black spectre with gangly limbs was moving towards us. He was hunched forwards, and his elongated arms dragged along the tops of the seats. He was too tall and too wide to fit in the aisle. I turned to face the girl. She had lifted her head from her hands. I could barely see her. I could barely hear her. She whispered, This is the last stop. She whispered. She whispered, I was really hoping you wouldn't board. I wanted more time. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, I felt an icy limb coil itself around my ankle. It yanked and I fell. My nose connected with the floor of the aisle and I heard something crack. I thought that was it. I thought that was the end, but I looked up to see the demonic creature coil its other limb around the girl's neck. It hoisted her from her seat. She screamed as she was lifted towards the indistinguishable figure in the aisle. I couldn't really see what happened in the darkness, but I'll never forget the sound her body made when it was consumed by the black entity. It sounded like leaves crunching beneath boots. I had almost entirely lost my sense of reality at this point, but some vestige of survival instinct persisted in my fractured mind. But some vestige of survival instinct persisted in my fractured mind. I twisted onto my back and looked down at my ankle. I couldn't really see what I was doing in the dark. I just knew I had to act. So with my free foot, I stamped on the creature's limb. I stamped as hard as humanly possible. The demon, which had been devouring the poor girl, unleashed an inhuman wail. It pierced my eardrums and shattered every window on the bus. The limb retracted from my ankle and returned to the shadowy being. I seized my opportunity. Catapulting to my feet, I spun around and lunged for the now glassless back window of the bus. Clinging to the frame of the window for dear life, I took one last look at the dark entity that was hurtling towards me. Then I dropped to my feet on the road. I sprinted away from the bus. Adrenaline fueled me onwards. I didn't look back. I just kept running. At the speed I travelled, I think it only took me a few minutes to reach the warm and welcoming lights of civilization. I looked at my phone and cried when I saw that I had service. I booked a taxi. I wanted the farthest possible destination. I chose Manchester, then I took the first train to London. For the past couple of weeks, I've been living in a hotel. I know I was a little late, but I finally took the advice of that online stranger. I moved away. 
I moved far away. I don't go outside at night. And I definitely don't look out the window after 3 a.m. I woke up this morning and strode out to the mailbox, since I forgot yesterday. I didn't see it till I'd gotten inside and sifted through the junk mail and bills. A letter addressed to me from my father. I stared at it for several minutes before opening it, and a tiny velvet bag fell out of the envelope along with a thick letter. I know the postal service can be slow, but if this was real, someone had royally fucked up. The rational side of my brain reasoned that someone probably had dropped the letter in some crack or crevice behind a desk or in one of those mail jeeps and finally found it after more than 40 years. Why 40 years, you ask? Well, he walked out on my mum back in 1981 and disappeared without a trace. Not that it had made me sad. He was always cold and sometimes downright abusive, verbally and physically, to me growing up. So needless to say, I didn't exactly lose sleep when he ended up on the National Missing Persons Clearinghouse in 84. I had long since grown up, but knowing he was gone brought me some peace. I'm getting off topic. The only problem with my lost mail theory, the envelope and the paper the letter had been penned on looked brand new, and my father had been missing for four decades and had been presumed dead in 98. I figured at that point that it must have been a prank, albeit a very elaborate one, so I decided to read it in its entirety. I was wrong. Now, if you couldn't already tell by the numbers and years I've been throwing around, I'm not young at all. So after I got through the letter, I damn near had a heart attack. I'm not completely tech illiterate, but I'm no computer whiz either, so I don't really know how to go about understanding it fully. I called the library to ask about some of the things mentioned in the letter, and all they had was a book by someone named Alistair Crowley and a couple of military history novels, but they'd all been checked out. So that's why I'm here. My daughter Olivia told me that people talk about weird stuff that's happened to them on this website for others to try and make sense of. So I thought I'd put the letter here. She got me a laptop computer as a housewarming present for the assisted care apartment I moved into last month. And this is the first time I've fired it up. And my neighbor Jan is letting me borrow her Wi-Fi. So I've spent the day typing down what the letter said and it's finally ready to share. I've talked enough, so I'll shut up and let you read the letter. I've used the pound key to indicate the start and end. This is what it says. My dearest son, your grandfather served in the United States Army during World War I, and like many veterans of the Great War, he returned wounded, both physically and mentally. Being born in 1920, I knew not what his face had looked like before the war, and as such, I never asked him about his time overseas, and he never spoke of it, as though those nearly two years had never occurred. That was, until he summoned me beside his deathbed, voice hoarse and dry, from the respiratory medicines working to keep him breathing. It was the morning of May 19th, 1979. A cardinal perched itself on a large branch directly outside his solitary window in the bedroom on the second floor of my home. He had lived with me for several years by this point, as his health had deteriorated and he began to need round-the-clock care. Dementia had begun to gnaw away at his faculties, and it was difficult for him to verbalise his needs or say anything coherent, also due to his lung cancer from years of smoking. We had visited his doctor the previous Saturday, and he recommended my father's treatment plan transition to hospice care. As his power of attorney, and not wanting to pry him from the comfort of his recliner and the familiarity of his room, I hired a home health service in lieu of sending him to a VA facility. As the light shone in on his recliner, 
illuminating his disfigured face, I approached. Father, the nurse said you wanted to see me, I said. Come to me. He said in two raspy breaths, slowly turning to face me. I approached in shock. He had essentially gone non-verbal several months prior, typically using only one word and pointing when he needed something. I knew it must have taken everything in him to be able to utter that sentence. Eyes still locked on him, I reached for the folding chair I kept in the corner and opened it, setting it next to his rocker and sitting down, joining him at eye level. He took the glass of water sitting on the TV tray next to him and took several sips. He set the glass down and turned back towards me. I need to tell you about Tourné. Your grandfather, who I will refer to henceforth as my father, began to tell me of his time in the 1st Engineer Regiment, in which he participated in several battles fought during brutal campaigns throughout France in 1917 and 1918, including the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, in which he saw several of his friends die. I wondered in which battle he had lost his left eye and most of the left side of his face, and what kind of weapon could have inflicted such an injury. In late October of 1918, less than a month before the cessation of hostilities, he and three other American combat engineers were embedded within a small sapper unit of the 63rd Division of the Royal Navy, who were in the city of Tournai, supporting French efforts to fortify the city. The German 4th Army had begun its offensive against Mons, about 30 miles west, and the forces in Tournai had been determined by French high command to be too few to effectively combat the Germans. As such, the French left their positions, though forgetting to inform the British and Americans who had begun digging trenches and erecting defensive emplacements. By the time they realised the French had retreated to the larger city of Lille, it was too late to fall back. While major action would take place at Mons, General Friedrich VI von Armin's 4th Army would indeed shell Tournai too. As combat engineers and sappers, the men, including my father, would have no trouble making their way underground. But under the threat of artillery, they sought shelter in areas where someone had already done the digging. These bastards aren't going to cease, men, shouted British First Lieutenant Oliver Westcott as he directed the men near him into the cellar of an old home in the city centre. As Westcott looked back to direct more troops inside, an artillery shell screamed through the air, impacting the street outside, collapsing the roof onto the cellar doors. During the explosion, Westcott was blown off his feet into the cellar where my father, along with Private Lester Daniels and two British soldiers, had taken shelter. They were now cut off from the outside in pure darkness. Are you men all right? asked Westcott, winded but physically unharmed. My father grabbed for his lighter to illuminate the damp, musty cellar. Flick. His face became illuminated, and as he looked to his left, he saw the nearly decapitated body of one of the British soldiers, his head severed by a piece of shrapnel, dangling from his neck like the last bit of metal you have to peel back after you've used a can opener. Fucking Christ, said an American sounding voice to his right. Private Daniels stood up, taking a step back. Daniels inadvertently dumped his haversack as he stumbled to his feet, ration tins and hatchet clanging as they hit the cobblestone floor. Christ, Baker, said a soft British voice. Another lighter flicked, and the face of a boy, no older than 19, came into view. His skin appeared as smooth as a baby's, with the exception of a deep gash on his right cheek. His eyes, however, appeared hollow. A tear escaped his eye, and his lip quivered slightly. A large, bright flame appeared behind him, and then slightly faded. Westcott held a rusty lantern he had found in his right hand, lighter in the other. 
The room was large, filled with old furniture on one side and large barrels on the other. My father looked around, searching for any possible exit point. The roof above them was constructed with heavy wood, many once strong beams fractured by the explosion. One wrong swing of a hatchet and the entire structure could crush the men in their escape. As Westcott berated his sole surviving countryman for shedding tears at the loss of his friend, Daniels pointed towards the wall furthest from the staircase. The mortar, he said, matter-of-factly. It's new. My father approached the wall alongside Daniels as Westcott walked behind them towards the wall. My father went to observe closer as Westcott brushed past him. Yes, it's lighter here, Westcott said. The mortar of an 8 by 8 section of the stone wall that stood before the three men was indeed lighter than the aged mortar that adorned the cracks and gaps between the other stones comprising the walls. Not necessarily new per se, but definitely not original. Lacking explosives and other tools that would be useful for dismantling a wall, all four men began striking the mortar around one large stone with their hatchets, hopeful they had found a way out. After several minutes, the stone fell backwards, leaving a dark hole in its place. A loud thud echoed through the hole, followed by a slightly muffled thud, and several more after that, decreasing in pitch each time. The men all exchanged looks with each other, unsure of what they had found. After half an hour, a man-sized hole had been created, and Westcott climbed through, lantern in hand. What's there? said the young British soldier, who had introduced himself simply as Arthur during the demolition process. Stairs, said Westcott in a questioning tone, almost as though he was confused by the concept of a staircase. My father entered the gap to converse with Westcott, with Daniels and Arthur entering behind him. A staircase stood before the four men, though not one leading back to the surface. Past the landing, the men found themselves on a flight of dark, jagged steps, which led down to a corridor approximately 20 feet below them, the stone from the wall resting at the bottom. Do we really wish to travel down there? said Arthur apprehensively. Another artillery shell exploded on the surface, the ground shaking, followed by small chunks falling from the rock ceiling above. With no other option besides waiting to die, the four men returned back to the cellar to retrieve their supplies and rifles, and then journeyed down the stairs. Greeted by a large passageway spanning as far as the lantern light could reach, the men moved forward. A soft thump could be heard above the men, and small bits of rock crumbled to the floor. More artillery. After walking for what he estimated was ten minutes, my father heard a noise from up ahead. A large shadow appeared around a corner, illuminated by the lantern, small appendages dancing on the wall like a finger puppet, a large oblong head adorning the top of the form. What appeared to be wings fluttered on the back of it. Westcott drew his revolver from its holster, racing forward with the lantern to confront the unknown shadow. He rounded the corner and stopped in his tracks. Lowering the revolver and chuckling, Westcott looked back at the three men. Was a fucking rat, he said laughing. The rest of the men entered the small room Westcott had rushed into. A small statue rested in the corner of the room, inscribed Clovis, in French. A rat poked its head out from behind the statue before retreating behind it again. The men continued on down the passageway, stopping briefly to drink from their canteens. Shortly after resuming their journey, the narrow hall widened. Christ almighty! Daniels trailed off, seeing a massive circular room come into view. The ceilings here extended higher than those in the passageway, though not by much. Enveloping the perimeter of the room like wallpaper were skulls. 
In the centre of the room laid a large rectangular stone object, which my father immediately believed to be a coffin. He approached it, the others in tow. While appearing incredibly simplistic from a distance, the dark box was covered in various symbols, none of which my father recognised. He then proceeded to open it. What sounded like a breath emerged from the coffin, and a searing pain coursed through his hand, as though he had been stung. He cried out in pain, clutching his hand, stumbling back. Daniels unshouldered his rifle, hands shaking violently as his finger slipped and he fired a shot into the coffin, putting a hole through the thin rock. Their ears rang and something clattered to the ground behind the two men. Standing there, facing away from them, was Arthur. The lantern laid on the ground a few feet ahead of him, flames slowly dying. Where the fuck is Westcott? said my father, voice trembling. Arthur turned towards him, face completely pale. He spoke in a deep, unnatural voice. He was all he managed to get out as the wet squelch of a hatchet burying itself in his head reverberated throughout the room. Arthur fell to the floor, blood seeping from his eyes, now red. As he collapsed onto his side, still facing them, he smiled. Just then, Westcott emerged from the darkness, holding his rifle, bayonet affixed. My father unshouldered his rifle and pointed it at Westcott. Wait, said Westcott, just as my father and Daniels both fired at the murderer. Daniels shot missed by a mile, his hands still shaking, but my father's shot pierced Westcott's uniform, puncturing his right lung. Coughing on blood, Westcott said two words that would make my father shudder when recounting his tale. Not him, he said, drawing his Webley and placing it to his temple. He stared straight ahead at the coffin, eyes wide. He sobbed a prayer. Our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Accept me into your gracious arms, O Lord. Before pulling the trigger, grey matter and gore spraying the solid ground, the shot deafening to my father and Daniel's already ringing ears, Emerging from one of Arthur's ears came a small fly-like creature, which then flew into the darkness. Daniel staggered backwards towards the coffin as the light from the lantern faded. My father followed. Using his boot, Daniels for some reason kicked the remainder of the stone lid off, revealing a skeleton adorned in jewels, rings and a golden crown, a sword whose handle was wrapped in rubies, fit between the skeleton's hands. My father said he did not know why the two of them didn't simply run the opposite direction. It was as though they were drawn by the mystery just as much as they were afraid of venturing outside what was illuminated by the still dying lantern. Daniels reached into the coffin, attempting to remove a ring from one of the skeleton's hands, breaking the finger off in the process. A low roar emanated from the direction opposite of which they had entered. A fly buzzed through the air and landed on Daniel's outer lobe. My father could only watch as it entered his ear, for as soon as he was able to verbalise that there was a fly, it had already burrowed in. Daniel's blinked and looked down. He felt the strap on his shoulder and looked at the wooden and metal rifle he now held in his hands his face reflecting off the surface of the sharp bayonet affixed to the muzzle. Daniels dropped the weapon haphazardly and stumbled towards my father, as if he had not walked in years. My father backed up, frightened. Daniels held up the bony finger in his hand and smiled, a pentagram carved into the middle of the ring and the script of a language unknown to my father at the time, surrounding it. Daniels moved forward towards my father and touched his face. My father screamed in agony and fell to the ground, steam rising from his cheek, 
his left eye melting from its socket and dripping onto the ground. Put on the ring, Daniel said, in what sounded like the voices of a thousand dying men. My father ran, grabbing his rifle and falling as Daniels fell on top of him. Blood poured out on my father's torso as it ran like a river from Daniel's mouth and stomach. His body, now resting on top of the rifle, bayonet, extending out of his back. Daniels blinked and swatted at my father, his hands unable to make contact. The bony ring finger fell from one of Daniel's hands and landed on my father's uniform. A sizzling sound came from his chest as the ring made contact with his skin after eating through the green wool. Another shout of unbearable pain came from my father as he swatted the finger and ring away from him. The buzzing sound could be heard once more as the small fly emerged from Daniel's left ear and approached my father, still pinned under the corpse. He removed his lighter from his pocket and sparked it in front of the creature, causing it to burst into flame. An unholy screech could be heard as it fell to the ground, wings alight like a plane that had been shot down, and it impacted the ground. My father stood up, moving Daniel's body from atop him and stomped on the downed creature several times before running to the lantern, now barely alight, and rejuvenating the flame. That's when he saw them, Hundreds of shadows without owners stood along every side of the room, blocking two passageways. They slowly began to approach him, encircling him with intent. He walked back to the center of the room, now his only option. Grabbing Daniel's discarded rifle, he backed up to the coffin, panting. The shadows were closer now, nearly upon him. Removing the bayonet, my father painfully explained to me that he put the barrel of the rifle under his chin and fired. As he lay on the ground, he found himself looking at the body of his friend, rifle still sticking out of his chest, propping him up like a pike. The shadows moved around the corpse as though something in the way, other than the body itself, prevented their travel. My father, in a final act of desperation, crawled towards Daniels, seeking whatever was keeping the shadows away from him. Resting under his rifle-propped body like someone sheltering in a tent was the skeletal finger, ring and all. My father grabbed the ring off the finger and the shadows immediately stopped. He placed it slowly on his finger and the pentagram burst into flames. The shadows slowly began to kneel my father looked around and gasped when he saw Daniels kneeling before him, his dead eyes staring up as blood dripped from his mouth, rifle still buried in his chest. His now purple lips moved and in a scratchy voice slowly said, My King. My father walked towards the other passageway slowly as he moved to escape, the shadows backing away to form a path some of the shadows began to take form, but my father refused to describe them. He finally reached the end of the second passageway, and when he turned around, the shadows were gone. After climbing a set of rocky steps, like those he had descended before, a wall appeared before him, and using the hatchet still in his haversack, still slung around him, smashed through the mortar surrounding a large rock and pushed it through. Outside, he saw men marching down a street, who paused after noticing the rock fall to the road below. Hello! He shouted, waving his arm through the hole. My father then pushed his head through and was greeted by dozens of German soldiers. As my father pulled his head back through, he heard shots ring out as the soldiers opened fire. He dropped to his knees and closed his eyes. Then the screams began, the sounds of flesh being ripped apart, throats being torn from bodies as their owner's screeches ceased 
as they separated from one another. And then there was silence. After hacking away at the wall enough to make a hole large enough to pull himself through, my father emerged to a street flowing with blood and bodies twisted and contorted like putty. One of the German soldiers was still alive, smiling. My father had left Daniel's rifle behind the wall and had already dropped the hatchet. In perfect English, the German spoke. You are going to need this, he said gesturing towards the man's uniform. The man then fell to the ground, eyes rolling into the back of his head, a small fly emerging from his ear. My father donned the German's uniform, ditching the Kaiser's garb after leaving the city, and walked towards Allied lines. American, American, my father shouted, hands raised, wearing only his undergarments and boots as he approached a trench. Christ, get a medic, shouted a British soldier. My father then collapsed. He awoke in a field hospital and was shipped home. He was fitted with a prosthetic face, covering his lower left side, along with a glass eye, as his upper facial structure remained intact, though heavily scarred from burning. While he shared his truth, the ordeal was chalked up to shell shock by the War Department. The official story was that my father had been separated from the rest of his comrades during the bombardment of the city, lost his eye and suffered facial burns due to fire and debris, while the gunshot wound was sustained when a German soldier wrestled with my father for his rifle and it fired, but he managed to survive. He received several medals and what he called a wound stripe, which was the equivalent of the Purple Heart at the time. He had the option to receive a Purple Heart retroactively later in life after it was introduced, which he declined. After my father finished speaking, he turned away and looked back out the window. The Red Cardinal still perched on the branch looking in at him. He smiled at the bird and I slowly walked back downstairs. You were up there for quite a while. Is everything okay? The nurse, who had been waiting on the couch in the living room, asked me. Yeah, I uh, was having a conversation with him, I said. She laughed. Robert, talking? That's hilarious. I've been here every day for a month now and he's only spoken to me once. She laughed. What did he say? I asked. He asked me to put on a ring. My father died five months later. He was buried with full military honours, dressed in uniform. As he was lowered into his eternal resting place and the preacher waxed lyrical about his good deeds, I held my hands in my pockets. It was quite chilly that day. In one hand, I gripped the funeral programme in the other, I held the ring that had been on my father's finger just before he was transferred to the hearse. In the years following his death, I travelled to Tournai and spoke with numerous scholars and occultists regarding the events surrounding my father's experience. This is what I found. Clovis I was the king of Francia from the late 400s to early 500s, ruling an area which comprised much of what is now northwestern France and surrounding areas including Belgium, where modern-day Tournai sits. Relics of his reign were discovered in the late 1600s, including a trove of gold and other precious jewels, metals and rings whose worth was beyond measure. Though converting to a form of Christianity later in his short life, he was born into a certain breed of pagans and held various beliefs that made those closest to him fearful. Vast riches seemingly did not satisfy Clovis, as he would begin practicing and experimenting in Gitya, a Greco-Roman form of sorcery that existed long before the term witchcraft was coined. While mostly consisting of innocuous spells and methods of divination, there also existed a more supernatural element, namely the practice of summoning angels, demons and other entities beyond our realm of understanding. The Catholic Church, having later granted him sainthood, 
sought to cover up his sorcerer's past, and, given the power of the church at the time, information on the topic is incredibly limited, found only in centuries-old texts and through the mouths of orators and mystics. One of the works that especially intrigued Clovis was the Testament of Solomon, a text written in Greek in which Clovis was fluent. The Testament speaks of King Solomon, who after confronting a demon, receives a ring, known as the Seal of Solomon, from the Archangel Michael, emblazoned with a pentagram, giving him the ability to bring demons under his control by branding them with the sigil. Solomon wielded the seal, bringing countless demons under his behest, including Baphomet, Mephistopheles himself. While certainly equipped with a strong conventional army, Clovis found the prospect of controlling an otherworldly force loyal only to him too tempting, sending multiple expeditions to Israel to search for the ring, his lust for control growing stronger as the years passed. The ring was found, and the fruits of Clovis's labour could finally be reaped. Shortly after summoning and employing demons to do his bidding in the catacombs, the king died. While the Catholic Church claimed his body was moved to an abbey in Paris, I know that he still rests in the depths below the soil of Tournai. I understand that this is much to process, though as the years drag on and I gaze upon you from time to time, know that I am proud of you. Congratulations on your new abode. Now, while I have lived much longer than I could have fathomed, I am not immune to mortality. It is time for me to bestow the greatest honour upon you, my child. When you were diagnosed with cancer, you feared the worst. But I called upon my servant, Svendanael, to heal you. When you and your wife began to fall out of love, I beckoned Buldumesh to mend your marriage. When you have experienced miracles, my child, they have not been of any god. The Testament explains it much better than I can. So, Ornias took the finger ring and went off to Beelzebul, who has kingship over the demons. He said to him, Hither, Solomon calls thee. But Beelzebul, having heard, said to him, Tell me, who is this Solomon of whom thou speakest to me? Then Ornias threw the ring at the chest of Beelzebul, saying, Solomon, the king calls thee. But Beelzebul cried aloud with a mighty voice, and shot out a great burning flame of fire, and he arose, and followed Ornias, and came to Solomon. Once he was struck with the ring by the lesser demon Ornias, already behest to Solomon, our Lord became the king's servant, along with his spawn. You see, my son, this is why I named you Solomon. It is now time for you to reign over Beelzebul and his legion and reap the benefits that come with such an honour. I know that you have seen the velvet pouch I sent you alongside my letter. If you have not opened it already, it is time to do so, my son. Put on the ring, and that's the end of the letter. I've been sitting at my kitchen table all day trying to process this. I opened the bag after I finished reading it. It was like an involuntary motion. I didn't want to, but I couldn't help it. I saw my hands move and could do nothing to stop them. It's going on 3 p.m. now, and all I've done today is stare at this fucking ring. It's exactly like he described it. It felt wrong at first, just looking at it like a kid gazing at a forbidden cookie in a jar. But it's calling to me. I can see now. It's so beautiful. It's just the right size. Since my wife Ruth died last year, I've repeated the same goddamn routine. Wake up. Check the mail. Watch the rifleman before lunch. Go to the Civic Centre for bingo on Wednesdays and watch mash at dinner with my microwave Salisbury steak. To my only daughter, Olivia, if you are reading this, I am sorry. I'm miserable, so I think I'm going to do something different for a change. 
I'm going to try it on. I'm sort of a uh, nature guy. I say sort of because I'm not a quote-unquote nature guy, but I spend a considerable amount of time outside. It's mostly downloading music and going for hikes in my area. That sort of nature guy. That is why I consider myself fortunate that my backyard borders miles of forest. This is fortunate because I live in a very suburban area where most people are rationed only a few feet of neatly groomed yard. My backyard isn't large, but once I cross the threshold of brush and trees, I'm met with unearthed stones that create mock canyons. I get to walk along skinny running creeks of water. Some of the rock formations are so colossal that the area where the rock meets the soil juts up and forms overhangs that I can sit under to get out of the heat. It really is a gift to have all of this behind my house. I had never had a reason to feel anything but serenity out there. But as of a few months ago, that serenity has taken on the guise of uneasy anticipation that something horrible happened out there. About three months ago, I went as deep into the woods as I had ever gone. I probably made my way through the trailless woods for about three hours. I was following a creek that was a stone or two away from being dammed up, but it muscled on anyway when something caught my attention. There was the base of a man-made stone structure. I went over to investigate. The structure was a dark grey rock that had patches of green moss running up it. I thought to myself that it must have been an old fire pit or maybe a well of sorts. But what the hell did I know? There was no one around for miles, so the structure had to be really old. I was about to keep on following the creek when it clicked to me. The structure was a chimney, the top of a chimney. At first, I was in disbelief. There was no way it could be that. I started to dig away at the base of the chimney and it kept revealing more and more chimney no matter how much dirt I moved away. I eventually got down on my knees and started moving the dirt away using a nearby rock to break it up. I went on, strangely invested in seeing its end when I struck roof shingles. Yes, a few inches below the dirt were the roof shingles. I didn't know whether to think it was cool or terrifying. I hadn't decided yet. I did know that I was going to come back with some towels and move more dirt away, because at the time, I hadn't been completely freaked. The next weekend, I hiked back out to the house. The house had been on my mind almost obsessively. I made my way out with a newly bought pickaxe and a shovel from my garage. After a pretty rough few hours, I made it to the house. I was able to remember its location, using the creek as a guiding reference. For the rest of the day, I dug at the ground at a gruelling pace, and sure enough, a full-size roof was being revealed. When I had just enough time to make it back before sundown, I decided to go back home, but I left the tools propped up on the chimney. I was exhausted and drinking some water I'd brought when I noticed how eerily quiet everything was. No animal chatter, no wind, just the persistent trickle of the creek. No, there was one more sound. It was muffled, but I followed it. It was a radio, and it was coming from the house. I pressed up against the roof and listened hard. The hum of a radio could be heard inside the house. Someone had to be living inside the house. I suddenly felt a sense of dread. I felt a sense of being miles from home and potentially not alone. I left immediately and made a leg-numbing trek back to my house. About two months later, I went back one last time. Curiosity got the best of me, and I wish I could say that I was smart and forgot about it, but come on, 
Could you forget about this? I made it out to the house. It was the exact same way I'd left it. Tools and all. There was no radio playing, though. I had gone out there early, so I had time. I got to work on digging out the roof. I dug a pathway to the edge of where I thought the roof would be so that I could dig down the side of the house. Relatively quickly I made it to the edge and began down. I worked fervently and with great focus until I had about an inch of window exposed. I stuck my head into the hole to press up against the tiny sliver of the window, but I couldn't make out anything. I dug for nearly an hour more until I had the window almost completely exposed. I pushed up on the window and to my surprise, it slid open with ease, as if it were new. The earth I was laying in fell away, and I tumbled down into the house. It was dark, but my eyes were adjusting. I sat up. The light outside illuminated the room a bit, and to my shock, the whole house was completely furnished and seemed like it was lived in and managed. The room I was in must have been a guest room. It was decorated in a very 2000s era fashion. Somehow the house had airflow too, and with my eyes now adjusted, I made my way to the bedroom door. I grabbed the knob and slowly turned it. The door didn't even creak as I peeked into the hallway. I couldn't see much, but I heard something. This time it wasn't a radio. It was someone crying. The hallway had an off-white coloured carpet flooring and a wooden staircase that led to the presumed first floor. Down the stairs, I could hear the gentle cries of a woman. I froze up. I wanted to call out for her, but I knew I had crossed a personal boundary of mine hours ago when I decided to come out here. I must have been locked up for a minute or so when a new sound was born footsteps, and they were coming up the stairs fast. I quickly shut the door and made a hard turn towards the window. I scrambled anxiously up the dirt mound that had let itself into the room through the window. Whatever was coming after me had opened the door and was gaining on me, but did not make a sound besides the heavy footsteps. I got out the window and slid it shut right as something pounded up against it. The whole time, the woman downstairs never stopped crying. I didn't stop. I climbed out of the hole and tore off through the woods. The whole way back, I felt followed by a sense of hopelessness and dread. I don't remember much from while I was running back. But when I got home, I passed out on my couch. I woke up a few hours later and the sun had set. I locked all of my doors and windows, scared that thing from the house would follow me, and then took a shower. As of now, nothing more has come of the house. I did call the police and report the incident about a week ago, so I expect to hopefully hear from them soon. The uneasiness of my experience with that house has kept me out of those woods, for good. In fact, I've kind of taken a hiatus on hiking alone. If there are ever updates, I can let you all know. But for now, that's everything. She pulled that face at me again in the reflection of the window above the kitchen sink. It was 6.17 and we had just eaten dinner. It was dark. Mum was washing the dishes with her back turned to me. Her reflection glowed against the darkness of the outside. Her lips were rolled back to reveal gum and teeth. Her jaw muscles rippled under wrinkled skin. The corners of her mouth yanked upwards to form a snarling smile. Her eyes bulged from their sockets as if ready to burst. Mum, please stop. You're scaring me, I said. 
She turned around, her face exasperated but otherwise back to normal. Her lips downturned and her tired blue eyes gazing at me with the usual mix of confusion and sadness. She thinks I'm acting out because of the divorce, as if I'm too young to understand when two people have grown to hate each other. At least I'll be able to sleep without hearing their shouts. I told mum that I think she's having a breakdown because of the divorce. We bickered. I grabbed my laptop and stormed off towards my room. She went back to scrubbing the burnt scum off a frying pan. For a moment, I thought she was crying, but the smile in the window told me otherwise. I first noticed the face at about nine in the morning. We were in the car on the way to swimming lessons when I realized that I'd forgotten my cap. It's a cardinal sin to forget your gear, especially when your mum is the instructor. Her bulbous eyes glared at me through the rearview mirror as she told me what a useless little girl I was. There was nothing funny about what she said, so I couldn't understand why she was pulling that twisted smile at me. About 20 minutes after nine, her hand was locked around my wrist as she dragged me through the empty promenade of the Oakville Mall. She had this curt power walk that sent clicking sounds echoing around the shuttered stores. I think she learnt it from one of her DVDs that came through the mail. The ones with smiling men in bad tan and cheap suits on the cover. They had titles like Be the Boss and Follow Your Power. Eventually, the sporty wear sign swerved into view. It was the only place that still seemed open. Mum didn't want to risk being recognised at a discount store. As if the teenager behind the counter or the fat, demented old lady wandering the aisles would know who she was. Like anyone would know who she was, I thought, as she sent me inside with a few bucks. The white fluorescent lights immediately gave me a headache and the stench of synthetic fabric made my mouth taste funny. I squeezed my way down the overstuffed aisles to the back of the store where the swim caps hung pathetically on hooks. Mom says my head is considered oversized in the swimming world, so I had to make sure they fit. I liked the green one, but it squeezed at my temples, making my headache worse. No good. The only one that looked big enough was blue. I hate blue, but it slipped on easily enough. I stood in front of the mirror to see how ridiculous I looked. That's when I saw the face again. Have you ever seen those nature documentaries where the apes fight each other to death? Do you notice how they're always smiling? That's all I could think of as the face paced outside the shop, watching me with an ugly grin. Get the pink one so you're matching, it said. I turned around and there was my miserable mother again. She tapped her wrist at me before dramatically throwing her hands up in the air. When I turned back to the mirror, she was smiling again. I could hear her teeth grind as I reached for the pink cap. Diving is one of the most important parts of being a champion swimmer, my mum would always say. She knew this because she got silver in the 1998 World Championships, gold in national. Her coach reckoned she had a solid chance at getting into the Olympic squad. Then her belly got too big. Turns out, the first time she had sex a few months beforehand, she and Dad didn't wear protection. Me, the happy accident. I hate diving. I hate swimming. But I hate diving more. I can't get the angle right. The last time I tried, I scraped my ankle against the board on the way down and almost drowned. But at 11.21 a.m., there I was again, shivering on the end of the diving board. The other girls were standing single file behind me and getting real impatient. Whispers traveled easily against the tiled walls until they were drowned out by my mum's demands. Her shimmering smile insisted that I dived in. I could see the full spread of her teeth. It was like her skull was mocking me. Just dive in. 
The other girls are waiting. I was wasting time. Stop pulling that face, I yelled out, my voice loud enough to silence the whispers and the demands. Did your dad put you up to this? She yelled back. I looked up from the reflection to see my mom, my real mom. Her face tried hard to remain stern, but it couldn't help but let out a single tear. She wiped it away swiftly. He's turning you against me, isn't he? She said. I didn't know what to say, but I was relieved the smile was gone. But it wasn't, was it? It was still there in the reflection when I looked back down. I felt two hands press against my back and shove me forwards. The force sent my feet out from under me. My body buckled in an attempt to stop from falling in. My hands grabbed the sides of the board, but it was too late. The bottom of my chin scraped against the tip as I flipped over. The world turned upside down. The warped grin of the face beckoned me into the water. I screamed. My face stung as I hit the water. The acrid taste of chlorine burnt through my sinuses as I sank downwards. I turned my body and saw a white light shining down towards me. It illuminated a glistening trail of blood that wound itself from my chin. Shimmering faces looked down at me from above the water. I realised the face was amongst them. Its smile grew bigger as if the blood was calling it. The white light exploded as something entered the pool. A dark figure glided towards me with an eerie grace. My lungs tightened and my throat stung. I tried to swim deeper, but the figure was almost on top of me. Thick tendrils of brown hair whipped around its head as it pulled me close. I tried to push away, but the grip was too tight. Amongst the mess of hair, I saw my mum's face, the real one. She had a typical look of concern, but this time I felt relief too. We were both safe. She pulled me skywards. As I've been writing this, Mum came into my room with a plate of animal crackers and a glass of milk. She told me that she was sorry and admitted that she's been too hard on me. I don't need to go to those swimming lessons anymore if I don't want to. I tried to bring up the face pulling again, but she took a deep breath and suggested that I go see a therapist. She thinks that maybe the divorce has taken a toll on both of us. But I know what I saw. I know she only pretended to leave the room after she apologised. Why do you think I'm still writing this stupid story? I know that if I stop writing and turn off the laptop, I'll see her twisted smile reflected in the black screen. I know it's her breath that I can feel on my neck. Mum, please stop. You're scaring me.